Hello everyone. Is it working? Hi everyone. I would like to start this second morning session for today. Uh, the session is on learning to make decisions and the first talk will be by Linda Wilbrecht from University of California in Berkeley. The role of the striatal indirect pathway D2R plus spiny projection neurons in choice and rejection. Hello, everybody. Thanks for, very much for the invitation. It's an honor to be on this podium. Uh, my question today is how striatal neuron subtypes um, play a role in choice. And I thought that this audience would be particularly interested in what my lab has found about um, three curious observations that we've made about the dopamine D2 receptor expressing um, uh, spanning projection neurons of the striatum. Now, before I get into the nitty gritty details of the circuits and the cells, um, just a brief mention of why this kind of work might be important. Um, I'm particularly interested in addiction and recovery, um, and striatum is implicated in, in these processes, and we're particularly interested in the, um, the role of D2 receptor expressing indirect pathway neurons and their potential role for um, suppression of choice or rejection of choices, um, which of course could be important for addiction. Also, dopamine D2 receptor pharmacology is a big business. Some of the blockbuster drugs act on these receptors. Um, and um, these are used in antipsychotics and antidepressants. And we don't really have a great idea of how they work. All right, so let's um, get into the empirical details. I work in mouse models. Um, and mouse models are great because we have genetic tools to look at individual cell types. Um, and the striatum here, you can see um, the salt and pepper, um, red and blue dots. Um, those are representing spiny projection neurons, SPNs, of the striatum. And you can see by the two colors that there's at least two subtypes of these cells. Um, they're intermingled in the striatum, but they make distinct projections of their axons out, to the, out of the striatum. And we can follow the activity of these neurons out of the striatum. You can follow that red line of the direct pathway. Um, and these are GABAergic neurons. And so spikes in these neurons um, are going to release GABA onto downstream targets. Um, and since I can't, it's hard here to point to both pathways, you can see this major downstream target, SNR, substantia nigra reticulata is receiving input from those um, um, D1R um, receptor um, expressing spiny projection neurons. Um, and a spike in those neurons is going to drive a pause. Um, the SNR neurons are, are tonically active. And so that um, there's a pause you can see in firing there, which can release activity downstream. And um, I'd just like to call your eye to this downstream target. There's also spikes. Um, there next to the PPN, the posterior pontine nuclei, and that's an area that we know can drive locomotion. The superior colliculus we know can drive orienting behaviors. Um, and then there's also inputs that are, are um, more classically shown in your textbooks, like a thalamus, and return to cortex. So there are these cortical striatal loops. Um, but in the rodent, we've been largely focused on the outputs to places like the um, posterior pontine nuclei and the colliculus. Now, the um, other flavor, the blue um, dopamine D2 receptor expressing spiny projection neurons, um, that makes up the indirect pathway, at least when you're in the dorsal striatum. Um, these have a separate projection to the globus pallidus, the GPE. Um, that's GABAergic. Um, and, and the GPE itself is also GABAergic. So there's this double negative there of two inhibitory um, uh, uh, synapses in a row. And then they're projecting onto the STN, this green nucleus, which um, is glutamatergic. And so that's going to excite the substantia nigra reticulata, having an opposite effect of the direct pathway. And so we see these two opponent processes through this convergence on places like the substantia nigra reticulata. And so it's going to have an opposite effect on the downstream targets. And that'll become important later in my talk. So in the last um, um, 10, 20 years now, um, we've been able to manipulate activity very conveniently in these circuits. Um, we have um, optogenetic tools uh, where we can use light, of course, to drive activity, and then genetic tools where we can um, express these um, proteins, uh, these channels in specific cell types. Even if they're intermingled, we can stimulate them independently. And so it's been the perfect tool to start cracking open these, the function of these different subtypes of neurons by adding activity to one pathway at a time to see what happens to behavior. Now, um, of course, when people first started this, they would um, turn on the light for a really long time and just see what the gross effects of stimulation were. Um, and, and what you can see very clearly, and many labs have, have demonstrated this since this um, first wonderful paper in 2010, um, Kravitz 2010. Um, we have also had a collaboration um, with uh, the Kreutzer Lab Rosebury 2016. We followed um, the stimulation of the direct pathway and indirect pathway 
the D1 and D2 expressing um, spinal projection neurons. Um, they make polysynaptic projections down to areas like the PPN. There's a mesencephalic locomotor region, the PPN. And we can see that um, adding activity to the D1 SPNs drove running. Um, and adding activity to the D2 SPNs drives freezing and stopping. So very clear, when you turn on the light for 20 seconds, you get these behaviors. And so um, moving on from that, this, this kind of um, gross insight into this circuit's function, the question is, how do we extrapolate from this um, to understand how these pathways might contribute to choice? We, we can also see that these um, striatal neurons are active in the hundreds of milliseconds before an animal makes a choice. And so is activity working in the same way as it drives running and stopping as it is driving a choice? And so um, it, it does seem like those things might add up, and I call this the Duplo model. Um, in case you don't have children, Duplos are Legos that are easier to manipulate. It's kind of the, the starter Lego. And so we're, you know, we're in early days of, of I think, understanding cell type specificity. So the starter Lego, I think, is perfect. Um, and so this Duplo model, we're, we can stack things on. We got run and stop, D1, D2. Um, dichotomies are also really alluring, I think, for our brains. Um, and so we can call this go and no-go pathway. Um, there is some lovely literature suggesting there's a bias toward reward or a bias toward aversion in the two pathways. And when we, when we march up to choice and stack these things up, we think, okay, one pathway is important for suppression of, sorry, selection of choice, and the other pathway for the suppression of choice. And I thought you, um, as an audience, would be interested in the observations that we've made um, that, that go um, uh, somewhat against this perfect um, dichotomy of everything stacking up. And, and all of these really weigh on the, not, not so much on the um, D1 expressing pathway, but this D2 expressing pathway and the indirect pathway and its function in choice. It looks a little bit more complicated. So I'll tell you um, about um, three experiments. I'm going to break it into two parts. Um, the first, the first part of the talk, I'll tell you about optogenetic experiments we've done in the context of a, of a task. Um, we've stimulated a dorsal and a ventral striatum um, on the medial side um, in a value-based decision-making task. And then the second part of the talk, I'll tell you about um, our, our use of hemogenetics in um, a, 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 also the dorsal striatum, just the dorsal striatum in this part. And this is in a non-lateralized foraging task, so there's some differences there uh, between the tasks. And most importantly, I'd like to acknowledge um, the people that did this work. Um, Lung Hao Tai um, um, and Moses Lee, who's a graduate student in the lab, are responsible for the work in part one. Kristen Delovich, um, a postdoc in the lab, is responsible for the work in part two. And Ann Collins um, is our um, computational collaborator, and, and she also um, developed the models that we used in part two and helped us apply them to our data. All right, so let's get started with part one. Um, part one uses a task which we call the probabilistic switching task. Um, other people call it a two-arm bandit for rodents. Um, and there are no cues in this task. The animal is self-initiating and remembering um, what it encountered in the task, the, the, whether it got water or not. That's what's driving its choice. When it pokes into the center, it doesn't get any water, but lights come on saying, you did a good poke, you've initiated a trial. Now choose left or right. And this is obviously a left rewarded block, and the animal is um, getting water 75% of the time it's choosing left. And um, after 8 to 23 rewards, um, the, the side rewarded will switch to the other side. Um, and so it, it can't anticipate because it's, it's um, um, really staggered between um, 8 to 23 rewards. Um, and 25% of the time it doesn't get water, even though it chose the right port. And here's a schematic of change. Here's a schematic of the task. You can see when the go lights go on, the animal is equidistant um, from the two choices, and it's also a convenient time because we know we can stimulate um, when they're equidistant. Um, and this just shows you, again, the left rewarded block with 25% unrewarded. And, and the, the side that's unrewarded is 0%, which is a little different than what other people do. All right, so um, we wanted to get a sense of how the animals are dynam dynamically updating value in this task. Um, and so one, one way to look at this data was with the logistic regression. Um, and here you can see the beta coefficients um, for rewarded outcomes. Um, we can see that the animal is using information from up to three trials back. The x-axis there are past trials, minus one, minus two, minus three. You can see that up to three trials back, there's some contribution of a rewarded trial um, to what the animal is going to do, though the greatest contribution is coming from one trial back. Um, there's also a contribution of non-rewarded trials, and they tend to be using information um, mostly from one trial back. And then action value, you can see on the right, is just the sum of these beta coefficients, the sum of the past trial histories of what happened in the task. 
Um, and it looks like a nice psychometric curve there. There's, there are no cues, um, but the animal is using its value history to decide whether it should go left or not. Or right. All right, so um, now we're going to use optogenetics again. And before we use optogenetics, really in a coarse way, um, where we turned it on for, for 20 seconds or more to get running. Um, here we're going we're gonna to do shorter stimulations, um, 500 milliseconds in the context of this task. Um, so we're going to be in the dorsal medial striatum in D1 and D2 cream mice um, using viruses to deliver channel rhodopsin. Um, we make bilateral injections, but we stimulate unilaterally. And we only stimulate 6% of trials because they do 1,000 trials or more per session. Um, so we, we don't want them to be updating um, after getting, making a strange choice. Um, and so 6% of trials is um, we get plenty of data. Um, and then here you can see we're stimulating when they're equidistant. Um, and they're right as they're making their choice, they're equidistant from the two ports. And this is published, so I'm going to go through this pretty fast. Um, but when we're in the right hemisphere, um, in stimulating the D1 um, receptor expressing neurons, so this is the direct pathway neurons, um, here you can see 5 hertz, 10 hertz, and 20 hertz are the three panels. And you can see the more, um, uh, the higher rate of stimulation, the more spikes we're adding to these neurons, and the more spikes we're adding to these neurons, you can see a shift in the action value space there on the x-axis. And there's not a change in slope, but basically we're, we're changing, um, and we're not just making a robo-mouse who's just, I mean, in, if I'm in the right hemisphere stimulating this pathway, I'm not just driving me I want every single trial um, to go to the left choice. Um, but we, we see the animal um, integrating the number of spikes with the, the evidence the animal had from the recent task history. Um, and, and so we're, um, we're seeing a shift um, in the action value without, without a robo-mouse there. And interestingly, if we go to the indirect pathway, again, we're staying in the right hemisphere, we're going to the indirect pathway, um, we see that we get a shift that's ipsilateral. They're biased toward that same side. We're in the right hemisphere, they're biased toward the right hemisphere um, in their choice. All right, so just summarizing here, we have this dose-dependent effect on, on choice here with the contra and ipsy. And this is kind of interesting thinking about our Duplo model because um, these ipsy and contra intended to look like little Duplos again. It suggests we also have to think about the two hemispheres. Um, it reminds me of the talk um, last night, you know, where, where we're looking at information from the two hemispheres. We're not just within a hemisphere looking at the direct and indirect pathway, uh, but also between hemispheres, they're probably interacting. Um, and then here, getting to some of the surprising things that we saw, we, we did go to look at movement time. Um, so we're not only expecting an effect on choice, we also think that stimulating these neurons might have an effect on something like vigor. Um, and you might predict from the Duplo model that um, the indirect pathway would slow and the direct pathway would speed. Um, but that's not what we saw. We see this interesting crossover that um, both the direct and indirect pathway, both the D1 and D2 positive um, spiny projection neurons can speed and slow the animal, depending upon whether the stimulation is congruent with the animal's recent choice history. And so here I'll just circle in red. You can see um, under the 5 hertz panel, um, it's quite clear the animal is faster than he would have been. So it's, you know, it's, it, it's zero would have been what the animal would have done for the speed of the movement um, on, on the 94% uh, of trials that we didn't stimulate. But stimulating the D2 pathway, which are the dashed um, line, um, you can see that it's faster than it would have been, it's significantly faster. Um, because even though you're stimulating um, the indirect pathway, it's, it's helping the animal make that left or right choice if it's on the ipsilateral side of the pathway the animal has evidence to go toward. And so um, just to summarize this, this first set of experiments in the dorsal medial striatum, we see that D1 um, SPNs can drive a contralateral bias, while D2 expressing SPNs can drive an ipsilateral bias. And both D1 and D2 SPNs can speed and slow movement depending upon congruence with past history. Um, now let's move down to the ventral striatum and stimulate the D1 and D2 expressing spiny projection neurons there. We don't call those the indirect and direct pathway. They make different projections, um, the ventral pallidum and the VTA. Um, um, the D1 actually uh, is thought to favor the VTA and the D2, the ventral pallidum. There's a little more overlap here. Um, it's a little um, more complicated. Um, but we do have um, neurons that express D1 and D2 um, uh, receptors, and there's interest in whether there's opponency there. And um, um, we um, and others can find that particularly um, the D1 positive neurons are very reinforcing in the ventral striatum. This is no surprise. This is a hub for um, reinforcement, um, a, a big topic of study for addiction research. Um, and if you release dopamine into this area or you stimulate these D1 um, 
expressing spinal projection neurons. Here you can see um, with just stimulating these neurons, a channel rhodopsin in 100 minutes, um, they're stimulating over 3,000 times. And so the behavior is very robust. If you don't take the animals out of the box, they will die. They'll poke until they nose poke until they die. And this is called um, ICSS. It's, it's, um, define their intracranial self-stimulation. This goes back to the classic Olds and Milner 1952 discovery, um, which, which led to um, interest in the dopamine system in the first place. Um, and so it, it's maybe not surprising here that the D2 positive spidey projection neurons, if you stimulate those, the animals are not nose poking with, with any um, great regularity um, to drive activity in those neurons. So we can see them as not reinforcing um, there's also literature uh, that suggests that it might even be inversive to stimulate those neurons. Um, and so let's take this into a task where the animals are in the context of a decision-making task. And I'm going to switch things up a bit. This schematic shows things switched up a bit. Um, um, the red X is not saying cross out and ignore something. It's, it's, um, it's meant to indicate the animal switching its choice. And so here the animal is going to initiate in the peripheral port, either the left or right port will start to say, I want to start this task, and then go to the center to get water. Um, and then go back out to either the left or right port, depending upon whether the left or right port is rewarded. So it's, it's a similar setup, but it's just slightly flipped from the first task that I showed you. And the stimulation is going to come at the same center port um, when the animal is getting reward. Um, and we did this because there's no information about what is a good side. You can imagine the animal will just develop a place preference if you stimulate. He got stimulated when he was in a certain place. He could just go back to this place. We were interested in whether or not we could reinforce something like an action trace of what did I just do. Um, and I came here. Can we reinforce that with um, um, spiny projection neuron stimulation and the ventral striatum? Um, and then we, so what we want to see here is not, um, uh, is choice, which is now considered the upcoming trial. Do they go back out to the, the same port they came from, or do they go back out to a different port? And so the blue um, uh, arcs there indicate the animal going back out to the port it just came from. Um, and then the red X there, the crossover of arrows, suggests that the animal switches and goes to try, is going to try the other side. Um, on the next trial after the stimulation. So what would we predict using this Duplo model? Um, you would predict that the D1 stimulation would reinforce staying with the previous choice, and that the D2 pathway would reinforce switching. Um, and here are the D1 data. Um, this is channel rhodopsin. We've got, uh, again, two different doses. We've got, uh, we're stimulating both times at 20 hertz, but we've got five pulses or 10 pulses. And indeed, you can see the strength of this reinforcement effect, the stay effect grows. Um, with, with the number of um, spikes we're delivering um, to these ventral striatum, uh, nucleus accumbens is a subset of the ventral striatum, these D1 spiny projection neurons, we can get a staying bias. We can also put um, um, an opsin in that silences um, these cells at the time when the animal is drinking this water. This is, um, remember, it's the, time, the outcome phase when the animal is drinking the water when we're stimulating. And silencing these neurons, um, so basically doing the opposite of adding spikes, we can see that we can also get a switching effect from silencing these neurons. Now here I'll go to the um, dopamine D2 receptor expressing spiny projection neurons, which have been associated with aversion. And interestingly here, we get a really big spread of data here. And there's, you can see the five pulse data, the first um, food bar. Um, compared to controls, we're seeing um, that some of the animals are indeed switching um, more often. But the, the average is that, that the animals are staying, that this is reinforcing. Um, and then we, when we went to 10 pulses of adding more activity to these neurons, this effect gets stronger. And we can see this reinforcement effect. And so this is, a, this is another, you know, the second surprise that I wanted to show you, the second curious observation about the D2 um, receptor expressing neurons. All right, so um, D1 drives a staying bias, um, a reinforcing bias um, in the task. Um, and also drives ICSS, no surprises there. But interestingly, um, um, that we can see that the D2 positive spiny projection neurons drive a staying bias, but they don't drive ICSS. And so this suggests to us that there's multiple modes of reinforcement, um, a different one that can be achieved through the indirect pathway. Um, and it might rely on the other activity that's ongoing in the circuit at the time. The decision-making task is likely to have other activity that's flowing through the circuit simultaneous with the stimulation. So that will take more to, to pull apart. Now I'll, um, I'll just move to the second part of my talk, um, where we, we decided to move to a different task, um, um, and then a different manipulation of activity um, to further examine uh, the, the function. Now we're just going to be in the dorsal striatum on choice suppression. And so we're going from a task that had two alternative choices that were opponent to each other. 
uh, left and right. Uh, we're going to go to multiple choices that, that can't just be in this left-right space. Um, um, so they're non-lateralized. Um, and then the, the first task is trained over several weeks um, with a thousand trials per day. So the animals are heavily overtrained. Um, we like this next task because it's more ecological. It's trained in a matter of, of, of days, tens of trials rather than thousands, thousands of trials. And then we also moved to, um, from optogenetics to chemogenetics because chemogenetics um, doesn't have this overwhelming effect on the activity of the neurons. It's going to um, uh, amplify the activity, the endogenous activity, or it's going to silence the endogenous activity. But we imagine that when an animal um, learns the weights of, of different actions, um, that with optogenetics we're just overwhelming things. Um, and we're also creating abnormally simultaneous activity, which is going to be read out um, very differently by downstream circuits because the temporal um, simultaneous nature of the ch channel reduction stimulation. Um, and so the move to chemogenetics we felt like is also a move toward um, uh, getting closer to endogenous activity um, and maybe helping us to see better the function of these neurons. Right, so the task um, that, that we moved to is an odor-guided serial um, foraging task, and I'll just give you a video to give you a flavor of what's going on here. Um, and so there's, there's four pots here, they're full of shavings. They all have a Cheerio buried under them, so they all smell a little bit like a, a Cheerio fragment, but the animals are very good at smelling, so we don't um, want to be just testing how good their nose is. What we want to test is how well they can learn about CSQs, uh, condition stimulus, that predicts where the Cheerio is accessible. And so they're, they're all shambated, but there's um, only one of the four pots is there an accessible Cheerio. We'll just loop this video back. So the animal's released from the cylinder, um, and it enters and rejects, enters, and then it's going to reject this choice, um, and then find one that it thinks is a, is a good choice for digging, and then it's going to retrieve this Cheerio. Um, and so they're visually not different, but they smell different. Their, their location is shuffled each trial. So they can't use space to figure out this. They have to use that odor CS, CS plus, um, about where to go. And um, this task has often been used to study things like reversal learning or set shifting. Um, here we're just using it for recall. Um, the animal has, um, there's one of these odors is, is particularly attractive to, it's just innate preference, we think. Um, and the animals like to go to the, the fourth odor in this task um, when we start running them. And they have to learn to suppress that one um, and go to a, a more non-preferred odor um, in order to solve this task. And we run them to a criterion of eight out of 10 correct. Um, and um, we, we, when they get eight out of 10 sequential trials correct, then we say that they, they've come to criterion on this task. And let me show you just what some data looks like here. If we train them to criterion on one day, and then we wait 24 hours and test them the next day, um, the, the animals are very good at focusing on that CS plus, that one order that was rewarded, and suppressing digging in all three other choices. And so in this way, this task is a, is a task of learned suppression. Um, and this one order that's particularly attractive, too, has been, you know, that's the hardest one for them never to dig in again and, and not get a Cheerio. And so lower score here on this test day um, means the animals are performing better at suppression. And so that's why it's, if you can't read what's in that bubble, if it's too small, it says fewer trials equals correct suppression. Um, and so there's, um, you can see that there were many, many um, um, dots. Those were each represent a different mouse. And you can see on this recall test, almost all of the animals are perfect um, in that they, they um, uh, come to criteria in, in just 10 trials, which is the minimum number of trials they can do to solve this task. And so this, it's pretty interesting, I think, that just, um, you know, just under 30 trials of learning the day before produces such a robust behavior the next day. Um, and I think that's a testament to how ecological this task is. All right, so what are we going to do? We're going to use chemogenetics now, um, and we're going to um, inject chemogenetics. Um, uh, well, we're going to inject the viruses um, um, that deliver um, these different receptors bilaterally into the dorsal medial striatum. And then these receptors have complicated names. Um, HM3DQ is the variety which is going to facilitate um, neuronal excitation. And HM40I is the, the, sub, the, the varietal that's going to um, um, allow neuronal inhibition. And inhibition and excitation here take in quotes. It's a little bit more complicated. These are G-protein coupled receptors. Um, that we're not dealing with ions here. We're dealing with intracellular signaling. Um, and I, just for the sake of time, I'm not going to show you the data that we verified that, that we can get these tools to work in these cells. Um, and then 
So these are designer receptors um, activated by a designer drug. And so these receptors have been designed to be activated by CNO. Um, and so this drug isn't in the animal until we inject it into the animal. And we're going to inject it into the controls as well, um, just to make sure that's not um, contributing to, to what's happening. Um, that just the drug alone isn't um, contributing to our task, but it's the drug binding to these receptors. All right, and so we're going to facilitate neuronal excitation um, or um, uh, neuronal inhibition in either the D1 or D2 spiny projection neurons into BMS. And we're going to do this bilaterally, okay? All right, and so um, uh, we're going to look at test time. The time that we give the drug um, is going to be just before the test when they should be really good at suppressing a choice. Um, and if, just, just um, a reminder of the controls, um, uh, we do have this acquisition phase. All the animals receive an injection of saline acquisition phase, so they're all getting used to having injections. Even the controls receive injections. And then all animals, all groups receive the drug, the dread drug, CNO, um, before the test phase. So they've all had that stressful experience. So hopefully we can roll that out. And so let's compare some predictions of what, um, what might happen. Um, the first one we can compare, of course, is this Duplo model, this kind of independent select suppress model. And here, um, now, instead of just looking at like, speeding or slowing or contra or ipsy, where, you know, things where we left or right or we had two choices, we now have four choices, right? And there's one that's high value. So these four bars are representing um, the values of the four odors. And so the, um, we can imagine that the value of odor one, this is the odor that's rewarded, um, through the training process the day before has, has become very high. Um, and we imagine that that could be encoded by um, the D1 expressing spinal projection neurons here in blue. Um, and so therefore, because this value is high, this would be driving the animal to select odor one. And so that's meant to be that little pot with, and with, the, with the white thing coming out of it is meant to be the butt of a mouse digging in odor one. And he's avoiding odor two, three, and four. And so that pot doesn't have any mouse jumping into it. And we can imagine that that, if, if we imagine this as a suppressed pathway, we can imagine the activity is high for odor two, three, and four, um, indicating these are choices you don't want. Okay, and so I think that that was that, and that was um, our mental model of how this should work. Um, and but, but an interesting thing about this this Duplo model is that the pathways are not an, independent. And we go back to the anatomy slide. We remember that the direct pathway here just focus on the direct pathway projecting to the SNR. Um, we can see that there's convergence from the indirect pathway also projecting the SNR. And so this independent model really, really misses out on this anatomical data that's, you know, that's quite obvious to us. And, um, and so it was exciting for us to um, um, become more computational through collaboration with on Collins um, lab at UC Berkeley. Um, on Collins um, has an algorithmic model called the OPAL model, opponent actor learning model, um, which is, um, it's an algorithmic model, but it's based on a network model which is inspired by this complex anatomy. Um, and this convergent anatomy. Um, and so again, we see these four bars. Um, Opal has, um, um, uh, is, is also learning the weights of the values of these different odors. And they're, they're, the um, Opal model has uh, the direct pathway neurons, which are, are emphasizing learning from gains. They're not just learning from gains, but they're emphasizing learning from gains in a, a distributed way. And then the indirect pathway, the, the D2 expressing spiny projection neurons um, in this model are emphasizing learning from losses. And then um, this model has, has multiple steps. Um, the, um, on the way to making a choice um, based on these learned weights, um, the activity of the two pathways can be scaled. Um, and then the, the weighted difference can be taken. Um, and then the choice weights here um, from this weighted difference determines um, what choice the animal is going to make. And here you can see that, that um, once this weighted difference is taken, odor one is winning out um, over odor two, three, and four. And so this model can also give you um, a, a sense of what, what the animal is going to choose. Um, and then the softmax is also used in this um, choice uh, decision. Um, all right, and so what predictions do these, um, these two uh, models make for what's going to happen um, for the, the D2 expressing spiny projection neurons of the indirect pathway? Um, it's really interesting to compare here. Um, so the, the um, Duplo model here, if we inhibit spiny projection neurons, you might imagine that you would fail at suppression. That, that's kind of the, the idea that would happen, what would happen, so I'll put a star there. You would fail at suppression, um, um, whereas if you excite the spiny, um, these D2 expressing spiny projection neurons, you could imagine you would really enhance suppression if there was more activity of these neurons. 
or you might just wreck the task. The animal might not choose anything at all because it's frozen in a corner. And interestingly, the OPAL model, which is why we do this, makes a different prediction. Um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting to see that um, um, inhibition here has no effect because basically the, um, the D1 expressing uh, direct pathway neurons are, are able to um, contribute the higher value of odor one over the other odors in a way that, that um, stands out a signal above the noise there. You can see that the, the it's, odor one is clearly higher um, after D2 inhibition. Um, and then the, um, I'm going to get the pointer here because I want you to focus. Is that showing up? All right, and so here you can see inhibition where we're, we're turning down um, the D2, the D2 expressing spinal projection neurons um, using hemogenetics here, and it's having no effect on here on the choice. Whereas interestingly, if we excite the D2 spinal projection neurons, um, all the activity here is coming up. And interestingly, that can basically swamp the signal here, and you have this flatter, um, uh, di difference between um, all the different choices, and you can imagine the choice would be more stochastic. Then. And so let's let's go to the mice. Um, and here, just to remind you, the animals that um, are M-cherry controls, they're really good at suppressing, and so they're they're nearly perfect at this task. The great majority of them are reaching criterion in ten trials, which is the lowest number of trials. So what happens when we when we um, we look at how these animals with these different um, hemogenetic manipulations solve this task? Um, and here you can see inhibition um, and excitation of the, of the indirect pathways by D2 spiny projection neurons. And then um, this is um, excita um, sorry, inhib inhibition of the um, D1 expressing spiny projection neurons. And only these two produce significant effects where the animals were choosing, they're failing to suppress, and they're choosing odor 2, 3, and 4 more often. All right, um, these models, um, if you're following me, you're, you're not surprised. These models were. Um, uh, but were predicted by the OPAL model, and they were um, uh, also captured by simulations using the OPAL model. And just to, to zero in and, and show what's interesting about this, I, I was trying to set up that it was really interesting to see what the indirect pathway excite, um, silencing and excitation would do. Um, and so here, if you just focus on this, um, the fact that silencing had no effect, but exciting had some effect, was really contrary to this idea that this pathway the greater activity is, 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 corresponds to greater suppression. We're, in fact, finding the reverse here. So this is the third surprising result that I thought I'd share with you today. And so um, I think this really, um, uh, in the end, supports um, why experimentalists should come to a computational neuroscience meeting. You know, that we, we think we can use English words and Duplo um, dichotomies to understand what's going on, and you know that, that, that even something as simple as a weighted difference, you know, this is just um, elementary school subtraction, you know, was was not easy to intuit um, using English words, and that the model really helped us to get there. Um, and so, um, the, the um, opponent actor learning model is, is as, as I've just shown, um, a better predictor of what's going to happen here. Um, and I think other models that take into account anatomical um, uh, elements like this are, are going to be important. All right, so just to, to wrap up, um, despite um, some unusual D2 spiny projection neuron observations, I, I don't want to leave you with the sense that um, our data completely disagree with current models. I think our data are, in fact, largely consistent with the literature on basal ganglia function. And the direct pathway, in, in particular, the D1 expressing spiny projection neurons, um, everything seems to really work out beautifully um, with what's predicted there um, when, we, when we go to test it. Um, and uh, we've had a lot of fun um, seeing how our data looks similar to other labs' data. We wrote a review with Tony Zader. Um, they were stimulate glutamatergic inputs into the stridum um, and saw some really similar effects on biasing animals in a two alternative forced choice task there. So we wrote up um, uh, a review with him. And we were thinking about the dorsal striatum um, being consistent with an actor, being, being participating in action selection, and the ventral striatum participating um, as a critic in outcome evaluation. And I didn't have time to show you today, but um, we, we changed the timing of the simulation in the ventral striatum around the moment of action selection and the moment of outcome evaluation. And interestingly, adding activity, adding spikes to the ventral striatum during the time when the animal is choosing um, did not have a big effect on, on, on choice. It had no effect on choice. Um, and so we, we do think that these, um, um, you know, we can, we can support um, classic models um, that preceded us here about the function of these areas. 
Um, but I, I do think that David Warren about the simplifications of dichotomous thinking. Um, it's been fun to talk to Anne Collins about that. Um, and you know, we really, our minds have some draw of going for a dichotomy. And so we find this nice D1, D2 tool, and then we just start stacking everything on top of that. I think we need to be careful. And biology, in my experience, um, everything we think about biology will always surprise us and, and throw us in the complexity. Um, and I, I don't really believe that nature um, enjoys parsimony very often. Um, and so I think we should also consider tasks that are more ecological with less overtraining um, and without freezing um, or left-right lateralization. Um, uh, you know, it's very convenient in the lab, but when you think about the context of an addict making a choice about what they're going to do, um, you know, this, this, this idea of actively freezing and stopping, you know, when something's cognitive and ongoing and moving, um, um, it, it, it might not give us the right answer even though it's worked well in the lab. Um, and I, I've already said this, but I think we should pay attention to anatomy. Um, both hemispheres, for a start, um, striatal subregions, we think those have different functions. And then these long-range projections are really interesting. Um, I didn't mention, but there's also lateral connections through the inhibitory interneurons in the striatum. I would recommend you look at Nicole Kalako's work, um, which also suggests the, the communication between the two pathways within the striatum is important. And there may be more cell subtypes. We're getting more genetic information about the, the kinds of cells and their possible different functions. Um, and then finally, I'd just like to end with, we, we really should get this right. Um, D2, um, expressing spiny projection neurons are likely of great importance. Um, the pharmacology, I mean, the blockbuster drugs that are some of the biggest selling drugs, at least in the, in the last decade, um, are acting on these pathways. Um, and so I think there's a real need um, for translational work to understand um, how these things are working. Um, and then finally, active rejection remains an important puzzle. How do we reject something without stopping? Um, that was you know, our initial goal in get to getting into this, and it's it's funny, you know, we still don't know. Um, and I, and so I, I'd love anyone to want to talk about that further. Um, I'd love to hear any insights into that. All right, so um, with that, I'd like to um, uh, first thank the people that did this work. Um, I'd like to call it Wang Hao Tai and Moses Lee um, for the first part of the talk. Um, Kristen Delovich for, the, for um, the second part of the talk, a wonderful collaborator um, on Collins um, for helping us so much with the OPAL model and, and moving into computational neuroscience. Um, I'd like to thank our funding and all of you for listening. Thanks. Looks like we've got some time for questions. And I really encourage people who are younger or new to the meeting to just get up to the mic and ask. And if, so, if somebody starts asking questions, especially if someone come and ask a silly question, because the other people feel free to. Uh, well, uh, I'm and, sorry, I don't know how silly this question is. But uh, the, um, uh, I thought it was really interesting, your finding about manipulating the D2 neurons and how surprisingly it also caused some repeat actions, but also in some animals it uh, cause switching and have that variability. Yeah. And so I'm wondering, do you think that could be due to variability in uh, the particular uh, manipulation site and the projections it has? In particular, talking about projections of ventral pelvis, and at least in the primate, we see quite a mix of cells there that are activated by bad things or activated by good things. So maybe you're hitting different subpopulations. Yeah, we, and we haven't published this because we've been trying to figure that out to crack that. and. We were, we were thinking for a while that there was maybe a hot spot that was different about those cells, and then we were injecting there and trying, and then it didn't, it didn't pan out again. But there is, in the ventral pallidum, there's really nice work. It's a bioarchive from Marcus Stevenson Jones, um, that different um, subtypes of neurons there can have um, um, switching versus staying like a VEX. Um, and so potentially that we're, 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 you know, I don't know if it's not top, topographical, but somehow that group is maybe hitting the cells that are projecting to either the glutamatergic or GABAergic subtypes of the ventral pallidum. Um, and maybe there's some um, I don't know, adaptive developmental plasticity in how that's set up across different animals or stochasticity into how that's set up. And, and, but we haven't been able to capture that variation. And, and I think there's new work coming out about s cell subtypes in the nucleus of cumulus. Maybe there's cell subtypes in the D2 expressing that, that will help, un, you know, help us decide what, what happened there. I'm uh, Peter Baring now from uh, Merck. Um, first time in the meeting, so I'll see if this question is silly. Um, I come from a translational background, really trying to understand what's happening. 
inside of neurons at the signaling levels. But I like uh, the research and using like a chemical perturbant to basically look at D1, D2 numbers in the signals. And I was curious um, if you considered like looking into some of these signaling pathways when you hit you know these different receptors. What are the um, signaling pathways that eventually lead to this emergent behavior? Yeah, and I think it's, it's really interesting to think about how to, what happens on different time scales, too. We, we tend to see effects that last, you know, the pharmacology is going to be slower and the intracellular signal is going to be slower, and we see effects in the next trial. And for us, they don't extend past the first trial, and there's been, um, you know, just with optogenetics, some other people have seen effects that last um, longer. Um, and, and so the, the time scale question is interesting. And now there's new tools to image things like PKA signaling, I think that will help us understand. Um, what's happening downstream inside these cells. Um, it's, it's easiest for me to imagine that it's, um, 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 that D2 pharmacology is biasing the, the um, updating of weights onto these cells and the strengthening of synapses, um, and that you can have stronger synapse uh, gains in response to losses um, when you have um, less dopamine tone, um, but it's, it gets more complex, I and mean, I really, I, the pharmacology is really interesting, and it's anything but silly because it's helping so many people. Um, but it's a lot of these things are partial agonists, and then they also affect receptor expression levels um, and receptor trafficking. Um, so I'm just, throw, I'm just throwing a lot of things on the table rather than answering your question. Is this, I think this is an absolutely fascinating question. There's neat tools coming in, um, but but it's especially with D2 receptors because they traffic and degrade. When you have a high tone on a D2 receptor, they traffic and degrade and they have multiple signaling pathways. Um, that I think it's going to be incredibly complex and we're going to have to um, you know, work together with pharmacologists and, and cell biologists to find out how this works. Yeah, no, it is super interesting. Like trying to move away from, um, obviously dopamine is super important for addiction for research, but um, trying to identify you know, what um, components inside of neurons at the signaling level um, could you potentially target, really be targeted Look at a certain phenotype, knock out something, see if that changes the phenotype, and if it does, sure, maybe that's at the target. So, using that kind of framework here, where you know you have this go and over response, maybe trying to do something where you know, CRISPR knockout is going to target of interest to see if you change change behavior. It's high throughput that's really challenging for the DVD experiment. Thanks. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. yeah, I enjoyed the talk. Thanks a lot. It's really nice work. Um, I was really struck with the result that inactivating the D1 pathway in the foraging task has basically no effect on the behavior. And it, um, no, it, it, um, it, it affected suppression, yeah. The direct pathway, um, uh, spiny projection neurons, the D1 expressing, that's what you're talking about? No, the D2 expressing. The D2 inhibiting, okay, sorry. Yeah. Um, I, heard, I heard direct on interrupt. Okay. Sorry, yeah, maybe yeah, that, that inhibiting that notes. Direct. Yeah, it had, it had, it had. We did not see. Um, they continued the task as, as they would. Yeah. And it, it just made me think about a question. I, I wondered that the classical model where um, D one promotes good actions and D two suppresses, uh, you know, bad actions. Why do you need that? I mean, you either have to, if if the D one pathway is selected for good actions and and the activity in D1 neurons is suppressed for bad actions. Just reading out that population should, should be sufficient. And your results kind of gel with that idea. And so I'm wondering if you think that, what are the contexts where it's more complex than that, where inhibiting D1 would inhibit behavior? I will point you to Ann Collins' OPAL paper. They do some simulations where they look at learning from lean environments. And remember that the, the um, D2 expressing indirect pathway is um, biased for learning from losses. Or disappointing outcomes, and so in lean environments, that becomes more important. And, and um, on simulations, give um, more optimal um, behavior in a lean environment. And so I think we can think about instead of the select suppress, integrating um, costs and benefits and taking away value. And and just it's um you know just also I, mean, I think we also need to think about what direction activity is going when we learn. People have shown that there is um, um it's uh, Shen 2018 that there's um, LTP onto the direct pathway, um, D1 expressing spiny projection neurons um, after learning, but there's LTD um, like changes onto the indirect pathway neurons. And so this is in the caudal striatum. Um, and so this, this is consistent with this idea that maybe when you're learning, you're actually taking this pathway down. And so bringing it up is bringing it back toward a more naive state. Um, um, so 
think we maybe just misunderstood the, the, the direction of activity with Lenin. Let's end Linda, Linda again for the wonderful talk.